so hello everybody to the seminar today. And today we have uh, our speaker is from Chile and from Atacama actually, near Atacama. Uh, this place, Iquique, right? I mean, if you are- It is in uh, Iquique, exactly, exactly. Uh, okay, so we have, uh, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll hear about conformal renormalization today from uh, your mm -hmm. Yeah, thank, thank you very much, uh, Ayan, for the invitation um, in the first place. And thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to uh, present some uh, uh, results, uh, some new results actually, on this uh, scheme that uh, we're working with collaborators with uh, Rodrigo Lea, Ignacio Araya, uh, on uh, this uh, renormalization scheme, on conformal normalization, in this case, in uh, Einstein ADS and um, scalar tensor theories. Uh, so, <clears throat> on the first place, uh, I'm just going to uh, give a very brief motivation on um, the introduction of, uh, of this uh, new scheme. Um, I'm going to say some very basic things on the framework that we are working on uh, ADS-CFT and some very um, basic things on uh, asymptotically ADS space times. Okay, uh, a, a small review on on the basic uh, prescription, uh, namely the holographic normalization and um, uh, the uh, introduction afterwards of the Count terms with K scheme that was, that was by Rodrigo Lea and how it is associated to the counter terms. And actually, continuing this line of thought, uh, we're going to introduce uh, uh, the conformal normalization scheme and some specific examples there. How is this applied in speci uh, specific in six dimensional Einstein ABS uh, space times and in a very, uh, uh, in a very um, a specific class of, of, of um, uh, scalar tensor theories, namely this, uh, that they are scalar couplings. Uh, in general, they are conformal coupled scalar fields, and uh, they are scalar couplings to Einstein and Weyl gravity. Uh, and at the end, the uh, conclusions and uh, some project that they are, um, uh, that we're working now and in the near future. So <clears throat> the the basic motivation, of course, for the introduction of uh, any normalization scheme is trying to render the gravitational action uh, finite. In this case, in the context of uh, Gates gravity dualities, even though we're mostly working in this case uh, in the gravitational uh, part of, of the duality. And the, the, the main motivation on this work is uh, to, to find out whether there is some fundamental principle actually, uh, in the cancellation of the uh, asymptotic divergences that they appear in the gravitational actions. Uh, and this is based on, 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 on the fact that, um, for instance, we're going to see after the introduction of holographic normalization and afterwards the, the introduction of the counter terms with K, normalization scheme that provides a, a fundamental principle that is associated to the presence of um, topological invariants, that possibly topological invariants plays an important role in the cancellation of divergences. Um, and, uh, uh, but of course, because there is a mismatch between the, these two normalization schemes, we are trying to extend this line of thought and see actually whether uh, bulk conformal invariants how bulk conformal invariance is associated to, 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 to this process, to, to the cancellation of the divergences, and what is the range of applicability of this. So, as I was saying previously, framework here is the ADS-CFT correspondence, which in this case is a concrete re uh, realization of the Gates gravity duality. And uh, as it is uh, known, the basic statement in, uh, in um, the ADS CFT correspondence is the matching between the generating functional of a CFT for a field phi naught and the partition function of a, of a gravitation, actually partition function in uh, ADS space times for fields which asymptotically uh, uh, tend to the 
uh, field find not of uh, the CFT. Th th this is the basic statement given by Gupser, uh, Klevanov, Polyakov, and um, Witten. Uh, and uh, of course, because in the, in this work we are of course mostly interested on this in this in the classical gravitational action. So we are in the in the uh, sandal point approximation. So this means that the strong uh, coupling limit of the CFT. Uh, this matching allows us to um, uh, interpret the genetic functional of the CFT as the exponential of the gravitational action for all the fits phi that tend to the phi naught. And this prescription actually allows us to obtain the universal properties of the CFT correlators the central charges, the vial anomalies, all the nice uh, stuff uh, there. And um, uh, the, the, the second uh, tool that is extremely important here in this framework is the introduction. It's something that we're going to use uh, a lot, is the introduction of the, the, the main geometrical features of asymptotically locally at the space time. So in this case, we refer to asymptotically locally in space times, any space time which uh, in uh, uh, for large values of the radial coordinate, where the radial coordinate here is this Z, takes this Gauss normal form and, um, and the uh, boundary asymptotically, there is an asymptotic expansion around the conformal boundary where the CFT resides. And this is located at Z it is equal to zero. And this expansion, it is a Taylor series, I would say, expansion in the neighborhood of the conformal boundary that this is in the most generic case, in the most generic case, for an arbitrary gravitational action, not only Einstein, uh, includes both odd and even powers in uh, the radial coordinate. Uh, but of course, in the case of Einstein, of Poincaré Einstein manifold, as they say in the literature, namely for Einstein space times, one can solve the, the Einstein equations asymptotically and see that all the odd powers um, vanish, and one can determine the um, even powers G2, G4, as covariant functionals of G0. For instance, G2 is uh, the scout and tensor of the boundary. Okay. But, but in principle, and this is because it is associated with um, uh, a di description with of high curvature, for instance, gravitational theories like conformal gravity. In this case, in principle, if someone has an arbitrary theory, one wouldn't expect that uh, the G1, for instance, or the odd powers uh, are identically zero. So in, in, this, in this context, it is, uh, it is to be expected actually that because ADS space times have infinite volume, one can see it actually from the fact that as Z goes to zero, this, there's this factor here diverges. So ADS space times have infinite volume. So in principle, to give this axis diverge, these are the infrared divergences that I was saying in the gravitational action. And in the holographic dictionary, this corresponds to UV infinities for CFT observables, for instance, like if one wants to calculate, for instance, the stress energy, the holographic stress energy tensor, so which is the conjugate, the, the, the um, observable that couples to the source G naught. Here, what I want to say, right? The G naught it is it is the source plays the, the source of the of the CFT dual, but moreover is the CFT data. It is a boundary metric that allows us to holographically reconstruct the bulk. Um, so th th this is a, the standard prescription in order to determine the holographic stress tensor. But in principle, this is expressed moreover as this limit at z equal to zero of the quasi-local stress energy tensor with this factor. So of course, exactly as the gravitational action diverges, all the quantities that they are derived by this, they're going to be divergent as well. And this uh, motivates us in order to renormalize the gravitational action. So with that, there were many prescriptions proposed. There was the Pallas and Krauss 
surface terms that uh, renormalize the action to five dimensions, all the Parr and Johnson Myers purely in the gravitational part uh, that actually allows to obtain uh, the counter terms that cancel the divergences. But there, were, there is a very systematic prescription introduced by Henningson, Skederis, De Haro, Solodukin, uh, a very, very systematic and well defined prescription that allows to obtain actually these counter terms. And th th there are very specific steps. So, in the first place, one should um, make the asymptotic, uh, obtain the asymptotic form of the gravitational action by just evaluating in the Pfefferman Graham uh, coordinates. Then, one has to regularize, so you impose a cutoff scale at finite radius, epsilon. Here, you, here our action is the Einstein-Hilbert plus the Gibbons-Hawking term, uh, which provides a well-defined a, a well Dirichlet problem in finite cutoff, in finite radius. Okay. And in th this way, actually, one can identify which are the divergent terms. So here there's going to be a power uh, a power series um, expansion in, 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 in powers of epsilon. And as epsilon goes to zero, one can identify this um, the divergent part. So the idea is that one subtracts subtract the divergent part from the regularized, remove the regulator, and at the end one has to revert the series and covariantize the resulting expression. So at the end, at the end, what is the standard counter terms? The standard normalized, the holographic normalization, the normalized action is given by this action. So Einstein Hilbert, the Gibbons Hawking term, as I was saying, plus these counter terms, depending explicitly on intrinsic quantities of the boundary. And as you can see, this is a complicated expression, of course, and the complexity of this um, increases with the dimensionality. Okay, so as you can see, this expansion is expansion in powers of the boundary curvature at the end. See, it is order one here, like a, 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 a constant in the boundary, the, the Ritzy scalar, these are quadratic in the curvature, it goes on and goes on and goes on. But uh, what it is interesting is that a few years after, after there was a very elegant way of uh, obtaining all these series. Um, this was proposed by Papadimitriou and Skenderis, where they posed the problem in a, in a different way. Actually, they managed to, to, to derive a recursive relation of determining order by order the counter terms uh, as a problem of uh, a Hamilton-Jacobi uh, formulation, but in this case for the radial Hamiltonian. And they demand a directly condition not for the age. So the, the, the claim is that the age is not a, the, a directly condition, a variational problem for the metric at, at, at finite a radius is not a well-defined problem because it breaks radial diffeomorphism, apart from the fact that the age, for instance, is it is given by all these terms. So as you can see, as z it is equal to zero, it is problematic. So they demand a directed variational problem for G0. And actually, this variational problem uh, demanding this, a well-defined variational problem for the G0 allows to obtain all the counter terms. So they managed to connect the problem of the finiteness of the action with a well-defined Dirichlet condition for the G0. So <clears throat> uh, at this point is where, where um, some, someone could ask is, okay, whether uh, as, as part of the motivation that I referred previously, whether there is a, um, an underlying principle that could allow us to obtain this series, if this is topological invariance or conformal invariance, or if it is just uh, it does not have a specific uh, uh, 
uh, fundamental principle behind. Uh, so, yeah, mm-hmm. yes, 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 uh, So, uh, uh, so if I so firstly, I think this Balasubramanian uh, Krauss prescription is simply a more gauge invariant way of doing this, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, whereas this is, but yeah, it's of course very easy to compute in Feynman Graham gauge and do it systematically like this. Uh, but mm-hmm. this uh, Papadidimus Kemdurist paper, um, uh, I mean, does it is it uh, is formulated in the Feynman Graham gauge or is it like a more general uh, formulation that that uh, in, in, I mean in in the in the in the Skederis paper, I mean, what systematically in in the in the in the initial to, to be honest, in the um, in the seminar in the seminal papers, not in the reformulation that they did with with Papadimitriou. The prescription was actually to evaluate, so you have to uh, to derive the asymptotic form of the gravitational action and do all the steps one by one. But actually, this it is not necessary anymore if you consider the formulation of Skenderis and Papadimitriou, because in this way they managed to obtain all of this just by making a matching between the radial derivatives in the gravitational action with the uh, boundary dil- dilatation operator. And actually they obtained all these counter terms order by order as, uh, eigen, as a, an eigenvalue problem for, for the dilatation operator. So at the end, yeah. in this derivation, that it, 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 it is an elegant one, uh, actually you skip, you skip all the, all the Pfeffer-McGraham, uh, subtract the divergences. You 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 evade all of this. So at the end, the what you obtain here, order by order, are eigenvalues of the dilatation operator, which to the leading order matches the radial derivative, and um, it gives you exactly the same uh, um, counterterm series. So if in ADS4, for example, it is enough to keep the first two counter term if we just have to remove the UV divergences. So exactly. is, does this uh, give you also some corrections to that? I mean, like, uh, does the counter terms include more stuff than this? No, no, no. In four dimensions, you get exactly, it is exactly the first two terms. I mean, the, the additional terms, they play absolutely no role because yeah, yeah, they are subtotal. That's true, but if I come mm-hmm. to a finite cutoff, they can play a role. But uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but mm-hmm. uh, but uh, this, uh, but uh, so just wanted to understand. So the derivation. So so at any cutoff, you can at any uh, value of the cutoff, you can find this eigenvalues of the dilatation. So it will. Uh, so I'm just trying to understand if uh, it gives you some notion of counter terms uh, when you come to a finite cutoff, or or does it uh, or does it uh, only or you only get the first two terms and nothing else in this way of- No, no, in the interesting thing it is, yes, if you go in a finite cutoff, in this case, of, of course, you 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 can have actually all, you obtain all, all the series. So, so, so they, they will appear all, all the terms. So in, in this case, actually, uh, you it is not, you, I mean, you 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 will get of course the r square the r cube the r quartic so so they are relevant in this uh, in in this sense if, if you consider it just a finite radial cutoff mm-hmm. uh, and you are not interested actually anymore on the divergences asymptotically if you want in this case to evaluate so the arctic flows or whether there is I don't know for some some people want to see it as an effective theory. In a radial cutoff, in this case, you, you you can treat all all these terms here, actually, of of the series. So this will give you higher level of theory at the at the radial cutoff if you consider it as a brain in the sense. Oh, I see. Okay, thanks. Yes. So so continue this this um. So the the line of thought here was. Okay, whether there is a fundamental principle be- behind this, and uh, the the idea this this was uh, working by Rodrigo in this place, and it is associated to the whether there's a fundamental principle was the introduction of the counter terms with K, which unlike the 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 standard graph normalization, where on top of the Einstein-Hilbert action you have the Gibbons-Hockey term, here you just add 
a quantity that depends both in intrinsic and extrinsic uh, uh, quantities of the of the boundary, which on the first place this would be problematic. Uh, this would be problematic if you demand a well-defined Dirichlet problem at a radial cutoff. But actually, as we're going to see, it is this has absolutely no problem if you impose your Dirichlet condition in Z0, which is consistent, as I was saying previously, uh, with what Papadimitris Eskederi said. And actually, in the, in the mathematical literature, it is true that the the what actually they, they were claiming is that for any asymptotically locally the space time, uh, the, the, the variation principle should be imposed in Z0, not in H. Of course, it depends on the problem that you're trying to solve. Of course, if, if you want to obtain RG flows or, or, or things at finite curvature, this won't work anymore here, okay? So the, the idea is the following. So this term has a very close, very well-defined form. So if you consider even dimensional manifolds, it is this object here. This is called the nth term form, uh, this convention form. And the, the further principle that I was referring to is the following, is that this object here, this nth term form, it is a correction to the Euler theorem. So to the Euler theorem, when you have non-conformal, uh, non-compact boundaries for, for, for non-compact non manifolds. Uh, so this means, uh, it, like the case of, of the ABS, that you have a conformal boundary. So this it is locally equivalent to the Euler density, that is a topological invariant. That's why I was saying that there is maybe a connection to this. And it is, the, this cancellation of divergences takes place only for a fixed value of the coupling constant. See that it is this one. In non-dimensional manifolds, you, it doesn't have the same interpretation because we don't have topological invariants of the Euler class. Uh, but there is a different geometrical object. This is called, it is a transgression form. It appears, um, I mean, it, it, its form is similar, but actually it is not the same object. I mean, it's a totally different object. It's a transgression form of, uh, appears as a contact term in the Chern Simons of an ABS group. Uh, with again a fixed value here, but the important thing is that this combat form has a very well defined geometrical interpretation. And the question that we're trying to, to, to that we impose that we that we pose here is okay, whether whether these counterterms match the ones that uh, was provided by by holographic normalization. In order to see if, if truly topological various or these geometric ter counter ter terms are fundamental in this sense. And in order to do this, Wait, we follow the. Yeah, yeah. Tell this, me. Mm -hmm. this, this, uh, this is actually. Uh, this, I thought that what Rodrigo was doing was a bulk counter term, right? Like, uh, like for example, he was doing this uh, cos pone. Or... No, no, it, it is, this is what I'm, go, I'm going to show afterwards. This thing, this tensor form, it's equivalent to adding in four dimensions the Gauss bonnet. It's exactly the same. There's no, there's no difference because oh, this, this gives so is you. It, uh, is rewriting the Gauss bonnet as a, as a boundary term. Uh, in yeah, the... Exactly, 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 exactly. I, I'm going to show it uh, explicitly in, in a couple of slides. I am going to show it explicitly, but, but it, it is true. It, it's exactly, it's exactly this. Yes, yeah, yeah, for, for, for in, even the you're saying, you're saying for two n plus one dimensions, one have to directly write this uh, boundary term. One there is exactly. I see. Okay. Exactly. 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 So on the first place, so before going to this, in order to 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 see the the whether they match or not, so we have had two problems in order to compare them. The first one it is that, of course, the functional form it is different. Okay, I mean, of course, you can see that here you have a Gibbons Hawking term. So the first thing is just to add and subtract the Gibbons Hawking term, to add and subtract the Gibbons Hawking term, just in order to match the, the functional form. So by comparing them, the, the term that appears here is going to be this, uh, the counter term with K plus the Gibbons Hawking. So 
in, in order to compare them, this LK should be equivalent to the counter terms here. The second main problem is that this is purely intrinsic, but here this LK includes contains extrinsic terms in the curvature. And this is surpassed by the following thing that the extrinsic curvature has an asymptotic expansion that it is analogous to, to the Pfefferman Graham, actually. If, if you impose, because the extrinsic curvature is just the radial derivative of the boundary metric. So if you impose the, Fe the Pfefferman Graham expansion, one obtains an expansion for the extrinsic curvature, that it is of this form, for this for Einstein manifolds, okay? And so the leading order is delta, this, the next two, the order z squared, it is the Schouten. Then you obtain the G2 squared and G4, where this G4, it is fourth derivative terms. So this is the Bach tensor, actually, and Schouten times Weil. So in principle, but all of them, they are, as I was saying, covariant functionals of G0. They're intrinsic in G0. So at the end, if you consider this expansion, you can write all the extrinsic curvatures in terms of intrinsic ones. This is what we did. And at the end, we obtained the following, that in general, for generic manifolds and for dimensions different than four, there is a mismatch. But what it happens is that there's a very specific class of theories, what is called the asymptotically conformally flat manifolds. These are the manifolds which this is the electric part of the vial tensor. This is the vial tensor with two boundary indices and two normals, two, two radial directions. If it falls like in the, at the normalizable order. For this class of manifolds, the two, the two uh, schemes match exactly, and they have a very nice, very compact form uh, that it is proportional to this quantity that is called, this is the meissner oletsovsky density where this is a schouten of the boundary, okay? So we realize that uh, they match, but only for this specific class of manifolds. It actually, to be honest, to be exact, they are equivalent for generic manifolds only in four dimensions. They're equivalent for asymptotically conformally flat manifolds in even dimensions, and in non-dimensional manifolds, one has to demand a vanishing Euler characteristic at the boundary. Uh, sorry. So, uh, yeah. for this ACF manifolds to be uh, realized, you need to um, you need some conditions on both the boundary metric and the energy momentum tensor. The dual energy uh, momentum it, tensor. It, it, it is this actually the only uh, the, the the fall off. Oh. The, the, uh, sorry, the, this is a value of the of, of the bulk. Actually, this is a value of the bulk. Uh, but actually, the, the, this can be expressed as a specific fall off on the on the boundary vial, Actually, but as a totally conformal flat manifolds, this is the electric part of the vial tensor, the one that appears at the conformal mass. Uh, actually, and this demands that this should have a fall off at the normalizable order. Um, I think uh, we did some, uh, yeah, I did with Marios and also we were, we were looking at some uh, specific uh, cases where you could uh, resum just with a perfect fluid and all. So we found these mm -hmm. kind of space times are very algebraically special in some sense. So yeah, that, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, that required something like the cotton tensor, for example, uh, uh, that the energy one term, that the dual stress tensor, T mu nu. Mm -hmm that should be related to the cotton tensor, for example. And uh, so there was some, some kind of relations where it has to be imposed. So I was thinking whether uh, whether this condition that you're calling ACF covers those mm -hmm. kind of cases also, like uh, for example, it, or... and to, for, okay, this for, for sure, I mean, uh, in, Actually, I will tell you, in four dimensions, in four dimensions, this is, uh, to, to be honest, this is trivially satisfied for all Einstein space times in four dimensions. But in higher dimensions, this is not the case anymore. Okay. Actually, yeah, uh, th this is th this is something that I would see as a very example. For instance, there are, in higher dimensions, in six, as we're going to see, the Schwarzschild ADS, 
you have topological black holes with different topologies in the transverse section. And one can show that there are specific topologies in the transverse section that they give you ACF manifolds and under uh, and other which they are not anymore. So it is not a most generic one. In four dimensions, it is trivially satisfied. I mean, this condition, because all the radial, all the all the radial slicings are three-dimensional. So they are by definition, they're by definition vile flat. Not, not, not they are vile flat. They are not necessarily cotton, cotton flat, because in three dimensions, conformal flatness is defined by, by the cotton, right? But all of them. In the d equals four, they are all asymptotically conformally flat manifolds because the three-dimensional slicings are are vile flat. This, this is a one explanation. Why do they match in four dimensions? So the the important thing here is that we will try to see this problem in a different point of view, namely what is so special in d equals four, and that this led us to conformal normalization that I'm going to discuss now. And it is exactly with your comment that we made previously. Here there's a different line of thought because in D equals four, it happens the following. The, the term that you add here is the second term form, the B3. And as I was uh, saying previously, through the Gauss-Bonnet uh, Gauss theorem, this B3, it is locally equivalent to, to the Gauss-Bonnet and the Euler characteristic. So you could equivalently um, substitute this B3 with, all, with uh, this gauss bonnet and the Euler characteristic. So at the end, you, you cancel exactly the same divergences. There, there's no difference. And you can rewrite the four-dimensional renormalized action in this form. And this can be actually uh, make manipulate a little bit algebraically, but it is just completing the square. This is a work by, has been with Rodrigo and Oliveira, Nine, you can rewrite it in this closed form where this is nothing more, this is the, um, uh, actually it has the interpretation of the, uh, that's why the, the, um, the curvature of the ADS group for torsion free manifolds. That's why it has this interpretation of the mcdowell mansuri action, as you can see. But the second interpretation that it has is that this object is nothing more than the vile tensor, but evaluated for Einstein space times. Uh, so at the end, this renormalized action in four dimensions can equivalently be written in this form. So it is this vile Einstein squared and the Euler characteristic. And now the, we know that this is finite, but a different way of seeing this, it is a very nice power counting argument. It happens that for instance, the, the, the vial the has three independent components if you consider a, a radial foliation, uh, like a, a radial ADM. So this is the electric part of the vial tensor, the one with the two radial directions, and it has a fall off that it is of order z to the cube. Then it is the vial uh, with all boundary indices that has a fall off of z squared. And this is, it is called the, the the value with one radial direction that it is associated to the magnetic part, if I'm not wrong, of the value tensor, that it falls off as z to the cube. And if you take this value squared, that it is exactly this combination, one realizes that to the leading order falls off as z to the quartic. At z to the quartic, actually, it is with the integral. If you open the integral, it will give you something that it is finite. So this combination in four dimensions, has, it is an optical with well-defined asymptotics. So this is a different way of seeing that this object has well-defined asymptotics because of the of of the fall-off conditions that uh, that the vial has in principle. And the second thing uh, is with respect to the variational problem that was defined previously. If one varies this action or the same thing with the with the, just the surface term it is truly manifestly obvious that you have a you do not, you, you have a problem in your variation problem if you demand Dirichlet condition for your um finite radius boundary metric because they appear 
variations of H and variations of K. So, of course, that's why I'm saying that the, you would have a problem if you impose your boundary condition at finite radius. But at the asymptotic boundary, at G0, where uh, one imposes actually this a Dirichlet condition for G0 at the asymptotic boundary, if you consider the Pfeffermann gradient expansion of all these objects, you obtain indeed that the variation is a Dirichlet for G0. And it is consistent because actually you obtain that the conjugate of this is a G3 that actually this is proportional uh, up to numerical factor to the stress energy, holographic stress energy tensor. So indeed, uh, you do have a well-defined variation principle for G0. So this is not problematic. Uh, so the, the question is, is the following. What is the origin of, of this object? The origin of this object, it, it is actually, it is straightforward because one knows that this is associated to the conformal gravity action, right? I mean, in, in four dimensions, one defines the, you have the Weyl squared, uh, which is a unique conformal invariant that you have. Here, I do not consider this additional Euler characteristic that it is just a trivial term. I mean, just for simplicity, I didn't include it here. So the origin of, of this form is the is the conformal gravity action. This is a fourth derivative theory, okay? Um, that in principle, if you consider the equations of motion of this, it is given by the Bach tensor. Uh, and of course, because it's a higher derivative theory, you are expecting by Ostrogratsky's theorem that you're going to have ghosts in, in, your, in conformal gravity. Okay, so this is given by the divergence of cotton, right, plus Schout and Weil. These are the equations of motion of conformal gravity. So how is this associated to Einstein? The, 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 the nice thing here is that conformal gravity has an Einstein sector, namely Einstein space times are back flat space time. So conformal gravity has an, a subclass of space time that they are Einstein solutions. For instance, if, if you consider um, uh, Einstein ADS, the Schouten is delta, and at once cotton is zero, and the Bach tensor is zero. So we already know that conformal gravity has an Einstein sector, and the question is, how can someone reduce conformal gravity to this form? And in order to do this, we have to introduce the traceless Ricci tensor here, Actually, this is important to the Ritchie tensor because the definition actually of Einstein space times is our space times whose stress Ritchie tensor is identically zero. So we take advantage of this. We make a, a value decomposition, a different value decomposition. So we start from this form of the vial. We add and subtract this one over L squared delta in order to construct the vial Einstein. And we rewrite the Schouten in terms of the traceless Ritchie. So at the end, we 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 write we make a value composition in terms of the Weyl Einstein that appears in the normalized action at this x. And at at once the conformal gravity Lagrangian obtains this form, where you can see that the first term it is exactly the one that appears in the normalized action. And there are two other terms, which when you consider Einstein space times. They're identically zero, and somewhat it reduces to the renormalized action. But now the so question the is: the Okay, definition of yes. Weil, the definition of the Weyl Einstein. Uh, oh, uh, this is the definition. Sorry, is you subtract this capital X out. Uh, so, yeah, yeah. so, 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 mm -hmm. so, okay. Can you just uh, sorry for this? Why are we doing this? So you're saying that the capital X part is zero on Einstein space and- uh, Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it is a trick. It is a trick that we do in order to, to, to obtain actually how we can reduce this action to the to this renormalized action, to the, this weyl Einstein square, to make it to appear explicitly this, this combination in order to, to see what is the process that we can go from conformal to Einstein gravity. Okay. Yeah. 
because we want to make explicit actually a statement. This it is part of a statement that Maldacena made the, uh, some 10 years ago. And, and, and now actually this process, it, it, is, uh, it makes this explicit. So, so at the end, the conformal gravity Lagrangian is this one. And as I was saying, so Maldacena was saying that actually, if you start from conformal gravity, you can actually project, you can select the Einstein sector by imposing Neumann boundary conditions. And the, 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 what, what we did, actually we made this, the claim it was, it was the following is that, okay, what Maldacena was saying is that the fermi gram expansion in conformal gravity, it is of this form, uh, with, a G, with a G1 turned switched on. Okay, because it is a higher derivative theory. So in principle, all these are free data. So in principle, the G1, it could be different from zero. And his claim was that in order to select the Einstein sector, you have to kill the G1. So you have to impose Neumann boundary conditions. And the same it is for asymptotically the Sitter as well, but we care about the ABS here. So in order to do this, we said the following, Systematically, we said that, okay, Einstein space times there, it will give you for h equal to zero. So you have to impose h equal to zero. And asymptotically, uh, imposing the Pfefferman Graham, uh, the asymptotic exp uh, expansion of, uh, of the Tressler's Ritzi, what you obtain it is true, this Neumann boundary condition. So the G1 has to be identically zero. This is actually the source of this is. At, at the level of conformal gravity holography, th this uh, uh, couples to a different stress energy tensor that is called the partially, it is the, the, the response function, the partially massless response function. So you have in conformal gravity, you have two sources, the G naught of the, of the metric and the G1 that corresponds actually to the massive modes. So asymptotically demanding this means that you have to kill G1 you impose a trace of G3 to be it is equal to zero. And in principle, one can use a kinematical uh, justification for G2 that in conformal gravity is free data. One can use the in vivo Schremer and Tyson to show that the G2 actually is, it is how then it, this is universal. This is universal using the PBH transformation. So this is a very well-defined mechanism of how you can select actually this, this term. So you impose these boundary conditions and by imposing these boundary conditions, you kill at once the H and at once killing the H means that the reach it is minus 12 over L squared. So these two terms die and you only, they only survive this one. So at the end, by just imposing these boundary conditions in their conformal gravity, you obtain the normalized Einstein ADS. So actually, this is this is actually the spirit of conformal normalization. Okay, that you you have conformal gravity with an Einstein sector that it is not always the case if you go in higher dimensions. In four dimensions, it is true, and you have to determine boundary the boundary conditions that will allow you to project there. And for free, for free, it gives you. The normalized Einstein in this action. And actually, it is finite for here. There is a power counting argument, and there's a specific um, analysis done by Gumiller. The, 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 um, if you someone wants to see what's the symptotics of the CG action, imposing this Pfefferman Graham expansion for the vial tensor, you realize that the, all the components, all the components, the independent components, R of Z squared. So in any case, the vial squared is going to be to the leading order Z to the quartic. The volume element has this fall off. So at the end, what you obtain it is something that falls off as order Z. And as Z goes to zero, this, this is, of course, it's going to be something that it is fine, right? So in any case, the vial squared, this contribution here, conformal gravity, it's going to be for generic asymptotically ADS conditions, namely with turned on G1, this is going to be finite in any case. And of course, this is what it was shown explicitly by Grumiller et al, where they made holographic computations there. They determined the holographic stress energy tensor 
the partially massless response function, these two observables, these two important functions, and they were all finite. So this means that if conformal gravity is finite, so this means that it is finite for all its sectors. So this Einstein sector as well. So at, at once, this means that truly conformal gravity, uh, when uh, inherits its well-defined asymptotics to its Einstein sector, and by imposing these boundary conditions, one obtains the value squared, and that at the end, this is something that gives you the counter terms. So the, this is the generic, the, the, the spirit of this. So what we try to do was to generalize this on the first place in six dimensions, which, which would have been a non-trivial example, because as we know, as I was saying, if you go beyond four dimensions, for instance, the counter terms do not match exactly the standard counter terms, right? Um, so we did this in, in six dimensions. In six dimensions, the things are more difficult. Uh, here I made a mistake, this is an I3. You have three uh, conformal invariants, I1, I2, I3, this complicated. So unlike the four dimensions that you just have only the vile square, the interesting thing is that uh, these objects, because as I was saying, all, all the independent components have a Z squared. One can show, again, the same power kind of argument, all the contractions that you are going to have, they are going to give you a fall off that it is of order Z to the six. And the Z to the six means that, again, similar as in this case, because the, the volume element now in six dimensions is going to be one over Z to the six, it will give you finite asymptotics. So in principle, these conformal invariants have a well-defined asymptotic behavior. In this case, uh, um, there, there is no, uh, uh, um, we are working actually on trying to obtain, to do six DCG holography to truly show that the observables, the dual observables are, are finite as well, but it, the computation are, are complicated, but we are in, a, um, uh, we, we, we are trying to, 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 to solve this problem. Ne nevertheless, we are expecting for this to be finite. But the question is the following. In principle, this basis here does not contain an Einstein sector. So we have to obtain an Einstein sector there. And in the most generic case, uh, for arbitrary coefficients of I1, I2, and I3, this is an I3, you don't have an Einstein sector. However, there was a work by Lu Pang and Pope that they found uh, a very specific combination of I1, I2, and I3 that admits in Schwarzschild ADS solutions. That it is exactly this combination here. Uh, and I mean, we manipulate a little bit. This is just some algebraic manipulation and we managed to, to brought it in this form that one gives, you have this delta six vial cube, vial squared schouten, cotton squared, and some additional boundary terms. And first of all, this action appears explicitly as the type B volume anomaly in seven dimensions. If you obtain the questions of motion of this, you can see that it depends explicitly on the Weil, Cotton, Bach, and Schouten tensor. And we showed in, the, in this paper that we generalized in the, the sense that we saw that on not only Schwarzschild ADS, but any Einstein ADS is a solution. So truly the conformal gravity theory in six dimension that admits Einstein space times is uniquely this, this theory. Okay, and then by the conformal normalization prescription, we have to, to find which are the boundary conditions that someone should put in order to restrict the full conformal gravity to its Einstein sector. So we did exactly the same thing as in the 4D. We uh, introduced the valid decomposition here, and at the end we obtained something that depends on this vial Einstein, a surface term that depends on Weil Einstein plus something that it is Weil Einstein and H. Uh, this P6, it is this combination of Weil cube and Weil squared. And uh, we managed to obtain 
in exactly the same way as in four dimensions, a generalized set of Neumann condition that allows us to kill this term. And at the end, what it survives is this P6, this surface term. And of course, there is always this specific Euler characteristic. It's always accompanied by an Euler characteristic. Um, which, moreover, it can be rewritten in this form. Einstein Hilbert, Euler term, and this surface term. Th this is very interesting because the counterterms with K, it contained only this bulk term. It didn't exist, this, this term here. This uh, vial, actually, this is a box vial squared. And the role of this box vial squared is truly actually to cancel the divergences that are coming from this object. To, to the leading order, actually, this depends on the vial squared uh, of, uh, of the of the vial, the intrinsic vial squared of the radial slicings. And the, that, that was the, the nice thing that this term actually cancels the divergences. And we showed that this quantity plus this Euler characteristic, as, as, as I was saying, matches exactly the holographic normalization, the standard counter with holographic normalization. So truly, uh, if you embed, if you embed Einstein theory in conformal gravity, impose the boundary conditions, it will give you actually the combination that dictates your counterterms. Okay. Uh, that's and, that's, uh, some, so when you say that it is the standard uh, counterterms, it means that's the uh, counterterms obtained by the Papadimitru Skanderism. Uh, uh, Exactly, exactly. The, the ones that I that they gave on the on the beginning, this holographic normalization, namely the, the um, so mm. in this case, let, let me just uh, in, in in six dimensions. So, sorry to go in six dimensions. This means the first line, mm. the, the first line, the first two, and the and the this squared in curvature. There is a full a full matching in in this case because uh, there is a full matching in this case. So so. You obtain, uh, you obtain. If you do this, uh, you want to, you want to see it. Uh, so, in this form, in this form, uh, you you may do the, the the same work that we did previously. So this gives you the start, the counter terms with K, uh, actually. So, and if you consider, if you open it. Uh, you will realize that truly you have a full matching with all this first line of the standard holographic normalization counterterms. So, so th this is in what it consists. And actually, we have some uh, specific examples. Uh, the, for instance, the main problem, as I was saying, here it is in six dimensions. One, we have the topological Schwarzschild ADS black holes, for instance. This is static, spherically symmetric. This is its form here. This is just the metric element of the transverse section uh, with different topologies. I mean, you have a rich structure of topologies in dimension two in the transverse section. Uh, this is the inverse Hawking temperature. Um, actually, for the Euler characteristic part, it is it is nice because one because usually you have, this is um, a product space actually. So it depends explicitly on the topology of this transverse section. Um, for instance, if, if you consider solutions, namely topologies of in the transverse section that they give you conformally flat boundaries, for instance, solutions like S4 hyperbolic or torus, this, at once will give it will give you the normalized action to be finite. There are no there are no divergences, and actually this is to be expected because uh, actually these are the solutions that you were saying previously, Ajan, that they once that they have this specific class of asymptotically conformally flat. Th these are the asymptotically conformally flat actually. So this, these topologies in the transverse section gives you short cell ideas with asymptotically conformally flat. And actually, this was this is expected to be finite because we know 
that for this manifold, we, we knew that, of course, they are finite and moreover match the holographic normalization. The non-trivial part was the other type of topologies, like for instance, S2 times S2 or H2 times H2, or for instance, topologies of the of the transfer sections like uh, the complex uh, the complex projective plane or the complex hyperbolic in this case. All these are are solutions which are not they do not give you symmetrical conformal flat manifolds. And in in principle, it would be if if someone would have considered the the country with K, you would have uh, divergences, but this is not the case here. One can show, for instance, that truly, if you calculate the, the Euclidean on cell action, this is finite, and this is truly, again, matches the result coming from the standard counter terms. And if you want to obtain the thermodynamics of these solutions, uh, you obtain, the it is consistent with the first law of thermodynamics, namely the mass matches, for instance, uh, this, this integration constant m here, that is the ADM mass. Uh, your um, this is the, the, the entropy that is consistent with alpha over four g, and it is consistent in general with the first law of thermodynamics. So, so in this case, it it, it truly it truly works. Of, of course, now we are working in an extension of this to eight dimensions. It it is not so easy. It is not so easy, and moreover, we don't know up to, to, up to this point how to extend this in uh, all dimension uh, terms. But we are trying. I mean, we are working on this in eight dimensions. The, the problem is that uh, you have too many conformal invariants, but but uh, and you cannot find. We know them, but it is difficult to find which is the Einstein sector. But the the important thing is that. This, this gives a line of thought that allows you to, to, to show that truly back value invariance is, is, is important. And uh, th th this is something that it is, as you can see, it is explicitly on for Einstein ADS. What we're trying then to do is to see whether this as a prescription works in scalar tensor theories. We didn't do for the most generic case, okay? We're trying to do some sp a very specific class of theories this is the scalar conformal couplings. Uh, this, this actually, this is an action that it is usually, um, they, it, it, they use it in order when they want to obtain uh, uh, gravitational actions that it is, they are coupled to this action to see if there are primary or secondary here to black hole solutions. They, they play this role. Uh, so um, I have a question. Yes. So I yes, think yes. for the six-dimensional case, you had made a claim that uh, there is a unique uh, conformal action yes. that 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 will contain the entire Einstein sector. Because mm -hmm. if you consider something else, then it might have some of the solutions of Einstein's equations, but not all of them. Uh, so now you are trying to extend it to scalar tensor. I mean, is it guaranteed to find uh, some uh, some kind of conf so? I think what you are going to do is find do some kind of conf conformal coupling. Uh, or some non-minimal conformal coupling, but I mean, is it guaranteed that you will always find some unique truncation or there will be always that you can find all the, I mean, just a, this statement itself that you will, will be able to find the whole sector of solutions of two derivative within mm -hmm. this, uh, is it guaranteed that there will be one such combination that you will find? Yeah, yeah. So so here we're going to, it is only, first of all, this uh, actually, this for scale test, it's just in, in we, we, do, we do it only in, in four dimensions on, 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 the, on the first place. And actually, the, the statement, most of this, it is, you always care actually to, to do it only on cell in, in this sense. You're going to see that truly the finiteness of, of this object comes only for the solution for the solution uh, uh, space of your theory it is it is, all, it is always um, uh, on on cell in in most generic case in most generic case uh, I, I mean I, I don't know whether you you will be able of course to to guarantee that that you can determine the full solution space but uh, as we can see here we can write it in 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 a nice way in order to see that it is finite at least, not for the most generic so, 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 solutions, um, 
but at least for a, a, a class of theories. And in, in case this is an improvement with respect to, to the, 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 the initial action. I, I'm going to be more, more explicit here. Uh, so so th th this is the theory that, that people consider as scalar conformal couplings, okay? Um, but, but the thing is that this is not entirely true because this is conformal invariant, but this is conformal invariant up to a boundary term. So of course the question of motion are going to be, I mean, uh, for, for, at the bulk it is true, but it is conformal invariant up to a boundary term. So, so uh, the, the question is, in, in this sense, is the following, is trying again to obtain, the, 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 the point is trying to file complete this, trying to, to, to make the file completion of this. And so, so, so in this in this case, so, I'm sorry. It is, it is here. Okay. So in order to to, to see the what's the bulk completion of this, uh, to render it, so we have to add some boundary terms. It is it is in, important to introduce this vile covariant object that depends on on um, um, on Riemann. Uh, on contractions of, 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 of the curvature with the scalar field, in this case, and derivatives of this. This object was introduced by Julio Oliva, um, sorry, and uh, this, this is an object that is explicitly conformally covariant. Uh, and actually, we realized that the, the, that there's a very specific combination of um, boundary terms that actually uh, is the vile completion of this object actually it doesn't even modify the equations of motion so so it was not it, in in this case it was not necessary to embed the theory in a higher derivative theory uh, and impose some conditions here we just need to vile complete the theory by introducing some boundary terms so we just restored vile invariance and because this is a actually this is a vile uh, covariant object we introduced this tensor sigma that it is just a um, S uh, just translated in the, in the field space. Uh, we add this phi to the quartic. Uh, okay. So at the end, this object at once, uh, this is vile covariant as well in the same way as S. Th this, it is a vile invariant action. And if you open it, what you obtain actually, it is this action, okay, up to uh, this is this phi box phi. It is exactly the same up to an integration, uh, up to a boundary term that gives you this phi box phi, plus the Gauss bonnet term with another boundary term that compensates this e4. So in principle, this, as you can see, it is totally of self value invariant theory, okay. Um, that has exactly the same solution space as this one, because we just uh, value completed by adding some boundary terms. And the, in order to see by restoring this value invariance, whether uh, this actually, it is going to be finite when we consider, of course, solutions that they, that they diverge, we did it to we use a trick we took advantage of the fact that the vile squared, the conformal gravity, the vile squared combination is finite for this generic asymptotically ideas conditions. So the trick was the following, was to make a decomposition of the vial exactly as in the case of Einstein gravity that it was this vile Einstein plus this X that depends on the, on the traceless Ritchie tensor. Here we made a different value decomposition that it is valid. I mean, one can, can play with this. It, it can show, one shows that this value, you can decompose it as this sigma plus this quantity that depends on T, where T is just, uh, uh, it is actually the energy momentum tensor for this matter action or the equations of motion, actually, if you if you do not couple to gravitational theory. And it is true, this is a, a, a a rewriting just of the vile tensor in terms of the of this quantity of sigma and t. And the interesting thing is that of course, of course, because this t uh, 
for this theory, when you have it as a standalone action, it is going to be identically zero for the solution space. So this means that the sigma is actually the vial. So this means that on shell, on shell, this action, it is, it is this vial squared, actually, and that we know that it has a well-defined asymptotics. I mean, as we have already seen, I mean, for generic asymptotic analytic conditions. So, so it, it is true. And for instance, um, th th this is a trick that we do. In this way, we, we avoid actually of showing explicitly the Pfefferman Graham uh, expansion. We take advantage of the fact that the value squared, we know that has value, uh, that has uh, finite asymptotics. So the question then it goes, okay, some examples of how this works. If now you coupled to gravitational theories, for instance, here you have the matter coupling, the scalar matter coupling, I phi is this one, to Einstein gravity. Here, for instance, um, you, we cannot play the, the same game as previously in the same in the sense that we cannot restore full violin variance. The, the violin variance can be restored only for the matter sector uh, by adding boundary terms, but not for the Einstein Hilbert, right? Because for Otherwise, you are going to change. You are going to change the, the the dynamics of the theory. And in principle, in principle, uh, on this, based on the comment of, of Ayan, that it is true. Uh, and moreover, it is difficult to find. Okay, what would be this generic hierarchy of true theory that I can embed this theory? But uh, here we found we found a different. A different uh, uh, route actually in order to circumvent this problem. So we know that we can th this by adding the Gauss bonnet, it gives you this vile Einstein square. So it is like you partially vile complete, but only for Einstein space times. That, that's the case. And you vile complete fully this I phi. So th doing this partial vile completion, this thing gives you this vile Einstein squared and this sigma squared, right? And taking into account the vile decompositions, one for only the metric, considering only the metric fields and the other considering both the metric and the scalar, you can rewrite this in this form. And here, here is the point, right? You have a term that it is proportional to the vile squared that you know that has vile asymptotics. And this additional term that in principle, in principle, you don't know whether it is finite or not. You know that if this is identically, if this is zero, so this is for Einstein space times or due to the questions of motion, stealth configurations, namely non-trivial scalar fields with vanishing energy momentum tensor, uh, this is identically zero, and this is going to be finite. But there are solutions that they have a fast fall off of this. For instance, an example of this, that it is truly works, is this, uh, uh, this uh, what is called the Martinez, Taforelli, Troncoso, and Zanelli solution, okay? Which, when you introduce this static and spherically symmetric uh, answers, um, into the questions of motion of the theory, you obtain this lapse, and this is the solution for, for the scalar field. This is the profile of the scalar field. And we showed uh, actually that truly considering uh, considering this form, the, the, the value completion of this, it truly it is truly finite. However, it is interesting that this solution does not belong it is not an Einstein space time. It is not a self -conf a stealth configuration. It just happens that the fall off, the fall off of this term actually, this has a fast fall off for this solution, and it gives us something that it is finite. And a final example, a, a different scalar coupling, is when you couple the action I phi this I phi to conformal gravity, okay? So in this case, actually, the, this, this term, it is already value invariant, 
not this one, but of course we can we can file complete this one. And uh, this actually, so one should add the additional boundary terms that while complete the scalar tensor part, you obtain this action. You, we use the value decomposition of sigma in terms of while. What someone obtains on shell, it is exactly this combination, similar as the scalar coupling to Einstein ADS. So it gives you something proportional to while squared. This has finite asymptotics, plus a term which similar as previously. This is going to be, uh, when this vanishes, it is secured actually that it, the action on is going to be finite. For instance, this is true for stealth configurations where this is identically zero, or if this combination has a fast fall off. And there are, sorry, Two examples there, and I'm closing. The first one is uh, because here the equations of motion is Bach tensor plus the energy momentum tensor of this to be is equal to zero. So if you impose, if you consider a rigid, a, a st static, and spherical symmetric cancels, uh, one obtains actually a stealth scalar field over the rigid metric. The rigid metric is the most generic, most generic uh, static and spherical symmetric back flat space time you obtain these solutions for f of r here m r not are some integration constants and lambda this is a, the profile of the of the scalar field and one can show actually that truly the euclidean action is free of uv divergences the same happens for a different solution a different branch here um, by the way, the, the fact that you have this term that is proportional to R here, it is a very a characteristic of solutions, of Bachflat solutions, right? Uh, and we obtain as well uh, something that it is um, free of any divergences. So, so it, is, it, it, it is something that even in, like, in, this, in this form, Actually, it works even for, at least for this class of scalar tensor theories, we haven't, uh, of course, we are missing, and this is something that is working in progress, actually, to do a purely holographic computation of, of this. So summarizing, what, what, what we show is how one can obtain, actually, a renormalized Einstein ADS gravity by bending it in the in a conformal gravity action with uh, an Einstein sector. And this actually, it is a hit on the fact that there is truly a relation between, con between conformal symmetry, between, sorry, bulk by symmetry and well-defined asymptotics. So in this specific case, for instance, we saw that if someone demands a bulk while invariance, you, are managed to detail to dictate the counter terms in Einstein in this gravity in four and six dimensions. And a, a partial actually vile completion again uh, so uh, allows even for this for this um, restricted class of scalar tensor theories allows you to, to, to obtain something that it is um, uh, finite free of diverse. So so there is a connection that of course we are we are finding some evidence some hints on this here and there of, of course we, we are trying to 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 see what is the uh, even what is the most uh, fundamental principle of of uh, of this connection but there is clearly a connection here so in, in upcoming work we are trying to generalize with nicolas um how in einstein and gravity we can generalize this to uh, higher than eight uh, dimensions. Actually, in eight dimensions, this it is even difficult to be honest. Because, but but it is something that this is work in progress. Uh, we, we are interested of 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 the, of generalizing the work of Gru Miller uh, by doing actually holographic computation, determining the observables of the um, uh, six-dimensional conformal gravity, uh, but the one that has a nine science sector, and this is a work progress as well. And there is an, um, a, 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 a variant, I would say, 
uh, of um, conformal normalization of Feinstein ADS, that it is the vile counter terms that it will appear in a, in a few weeks, actually, that allows to determine all these counter terms um, without needing to embed it in conformal gravity. Uh, and this allows us to, to obtain actually uh, this class of counter terms up to eight, eight, up to ten dimensions. To be honest, there, there's no need actually to embed it in 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 a high dimension conformal gravity. Uh, want to to see what is the extension of this to all dimensional manifolds? Apply the asymptotic analysis and find the holographic properties of the scalar tensor theories. So we manage to to show the fineness using this trick in terms of the asymptotics of the vile squared but we're interested to do explicitly what is the uh, holographic properties of these theories. And there is some interesting issues when uh, considers actually co-dimension two functionals, uh, which are uh, apparently actually the, the same way defined asymptotics when you have bulk value invariance is inherited to co-dimension two functionals which are invariant under, under value transformations of ambient space times. This is a, we, we have a, we have shown this uh, in the case of Wilmore energy and the reduced Hawking mass from four to two dimensions, but we are generalizing this to obtain four dimensional energy functionals coming from 6D theories. And that's it, thank you very much. Uh, thanks for this. It's a wonderful talk, your viewers. Uh, so uh, maybe we should take questions. And uh, so let's take questions uh, from. Uh, okay, so I think that one uh, one one of the things I wanted to ask is already in a list of to do things. So. Uh, mm -hmm. So let me ask uh, something that I had. So is it there is no way you could, of course, extend it for massive uh, scalars, right? I mean, if you have bulk massive scalars, you cannot do this procedure anymore. You know, this conformal oh. the, the thing is, we have we have we have it done it. I mean, the, the thing is, we are still trying to to understand. That. And actually, I cannot say if it will work in the case when when you have massive uh, massive. Uh, uh, scalar. I, I suppose that if you have massive scalar modes in this case, you, you break, uh, of course, um, a violin invariance. Uh, I, I would say you are expected. So, so I don't know how this would work. Uh, in principle, uh, you can always uh, convert this mass to some field and then uh, mm -hmm. and it's a field and later, you know, make make the field some, something like a constant. So in a special case when the field is a constant value, you could say that, okay, and get away. Yeah. With it. Th th this is true. This is this is true. This is true. Yes, you, you th th this this is this is true. Yeah, this is something that you, you could consider. Uh, yes, but but in 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 principle, I, I think th this it is uh, just a very specific class that we have worked on this. But uh, we, we at some point we want to to apply them in a more generic uh, framework if possible. So. I, I I don't know to 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 be honest. So it, it is possible. I mean, it is something that could could be done. Yeah, very, very nice actually. Uh, so uh, for the odd dimensional case, do you have any thoughts? There seem to be some relation between seventy and sixty. That the way you get got this action uh, has something to do with the seventy uh, case. The, the thing the thing is the following. It is we know that actually. I mean, in 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 uh, to be honest, now in four dimension it was trivial because actually, all uh, obviously you have only conformal invariant, so obviously you are having only the vile squared. But what was weird is that the theory, so the conformal gravity theory, that has an Einstein sector is exactly is exactly the combination of coefficient that gives you the vile. This is a vile anomaly at the end. This is a vile anomaly of of, of seventy. So it corresponds. It corresponds to this. So, but the the thing is, uh, to be honest, I mean, it is not known which are what is the classification of of global conformal invariance in all dimensions. Th that is actually the, the the main problem. If you if I want to to generalize it 
in all dimensional manifolds and you want to play the same game for the Einstein ADS, the main problem that you have is which are the, the global conformal invariants that you have, you have the classification in even dimensions, not in arbitrary, but up to eight, you, you have it. And how can this ex be extended in all dimensions? This is not known. H however, however, th th there's something interesting and it has to do with these things that I'm referring here as, as valid counterterms. Because in, in, in this case, I don't need, I don't need to embed it in a conformal gravity. I, I use I use vial invariance, but I don't need to find which are the global conformal invariants. So I'm I'm trying to to restore a vial. I'm making a vial completion, but actually on shell on shell for, for the solutions. And you obtain you obtain the the countries for free in in even dimensions. And what I suspect what I, I suspect in this case is that you can play the same game for for the terms but i don't know if it works the same principle i don't know for instance if in not dimensional manifolds someone should consider vile invariance or not because what we conjecture well, our conjecture is that this probably works in uh, in uh, in even dimensions because even though it is not the same vile group because in the one case you have boundary vial, it's not bulk vial, but it is probably associated to the fact that you don't have a vial anomaly in um, in no dimensional boundaries, but but in even dimensional boundaries. So this means for all dimensional bulk manifolds, you do have an anomaly. So maybe the basic principle it may be different. Maybe it is not vial invariance. Maybe it is the principle. It may be uh, something there should be a modification of this, but this is, up to now we, we don't know how, how this could be extended. Okay, then I have a final question. So, in the beginning, you say there was a discrepancy between the usual counterterm method and the K counterterm counter method with the K, and mm -hmm. then uh, but then you say that this conformal regularization more justifies more the usual counterterm method, not the Exactly, exactly. That, that that's the case. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, I mean, for, for the the standard counterterms of holographic normalization are the ones that they cancel the divergences to all orders. There's no doubt, doubt on this. Uh, so what we are trying to see is that actually at the end, the a different way of obtaining the standard. First of all, so conformal normalization fixes, I would say, the problem of the counterterms with K because it is associated to this, because you can see it is an extension. It is a standard counterterm terms plus something. Mm -hmm. But the, the thing is that this plus something allows you to match the standard holographic normalization counterterms. So at the end, the, it tells you that conformal normalization and actually bulk value variance is a way that allows you truly to resum, because it's like a resummation at the end of, of the series. That, 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 that's the point. It's like a, a resummation of the series up to the relevant order. The, the, this is what it does. Um, for instance, the, uh, for instance, the, stand, the counterterms with K, just for this asymptotic conformity flat manifolds, it gives you a compact expression in arbitrary even, even dimensions for the full series. So it is a resummation of this. So, what the conformal normalization does is at the end tells you that all the series uh, of this boundary counterterms of, of holographic normalization, you can write them in a closed form as the standard counterterms with K plus the additional terms. And the important thing is that it, uh, you, you write them moreover in terms of purely bulk terms, right? Because if you if you saw in six dimensions, for instance, let me here. In six dimensions, what you obtain is Einstein Hilbert, the topological, the Euler density. And this term, even though this this one, this term here, it is written in this form, at the end, it is actually the box. This is just box 
violent sign squared. It's exactly this. So, so you can write it as a pure bulk term. And if you if you play with this, of course, you can show that it is exactly equivalent. So, so it tells you that you can resum all the renormalized Einstein Einstein ADS action, namely Einstein Hilbert plus Gibbons Hawking plus the counter term series in a pure bulk term that is totally equivalent. And it is covariant, it is bulk covariant. Moreover, it's bulk covariant. Here, here okay, is it, I have written it as a boundary term, but actually it is true that the form of this, it is um, it is a box vile squared, box vile Einstein squared. Mm -hmm. hmm. I see. Okay, uh, I see, I see. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, so let me thank you for your time and your nice talk again. And thank you very much, uh, Jan. Thank you very much for uh, all the, the audience as well. Yeah, I stopped.